in the right place. This is the Eat Fluencer Podcast, and I'm your host, Dr. Maggie Landis. Together, we are going to unpack everything about eating and discover the what, when, and how that will let you lead your best life. This is not your doctor's conversation about nutrition. Today is when you can start to love eating again. Let food be food and you be you. Get ready to get eat fluenced. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. We have a special episode today. This is the first birthday of the Eat Fluencer podcast. Yay! A whole year of podcasts. This is actually episode 56 because I did have a few uh, weeks earlier in the year when my endurance was much stronger and I did a couple episodes in a single week. So we're up to episode 56 and here we are. If you're new joining me today, I'm Maggie Landis. I'm a physician and a public health nutritionist by training, but I am the diet culture disruptor and the Effluencer podcast is a space I created where we can systematically unlearn and unravel is probably a better word, all this diet culture conditioning. And we talk about some science here. We talk about some mindset. We talk about some food. We talk about lots of things that are important to you uh, with health and nutrition, but in a very different non-diet way. So you're listening to episode 56 today, and uh, we've covered a lot of ground in the last year since I started this podcast in October of 2020. I'm constantly thinking about you know, what I haven't covered, what we can expand on, what to do next. But I will tell you my biggest win of the year is my community that I've created. You know, that's you, podcast listeners, people in my private Facebook community, my social media uh, communities, you know, the clients that have trusted me in my coaching programs. It takes a whole village to support each other while we unlearn this diet culture conditioning. And for the moment, until the culture is truly disrupted, we still have to navigate this really treacherous landscape of toxic messaging and really uh, ungrounded health information being passed around. Um, So what I'm doing today on this episode to celebrate the first birthday, uh, we are going, I'm going to answer some questions. I'm going to highlight questions that you all, my community members have asked my, you know, my initial idea was I wanted to try to answer 20 questions in 20 minutes, but who am I kidding? (laughs) There's no chance that's going to happen. So I have picked 16, just a random number of the very best most common and most direct questions that I get. Some of them are related to diet culture. Some of them are related to uh, weight stigma. Some are just personal questions about me, Maggie, and my choices in life and all sorts of things. It'll be an interesting go here. I'm going to try to do rapid fire sort of style, maybe a minute, minute and a half per question so that this um, isn't like the never ending episode. But I just want you to get to know the non-diet approach to nutrition a little more and get to know me a little more as we celebrate here our uh, birthday. I'm about to have a birthday, by the way. My birthday is in a few weeks. I'm not doing a special episode for my birthday, but uh, I'm about to turn 45. So I have uh, a lot to be thankful for in my 45 years and a lot to hopefully look forward to in the next, you know, 45. So let me take a drink of water. We're going to get down to the birthday Q&A. So number one, how can I reject diet culture without feeling like I've given up, air quotes, on working towards a, quote, better version of myself? Basically, this person apparently feels like they are no longer going to be able to better themselves if they quit pursuing weight loss. Well, here's here's the answer to this. If better equals thin you will be stuck in diet culture. That is actually the definition of diet culture is that thin is better. Um, 
But if you can expand your definition of better, meaning you are more energetic, peaceful, you are a compassionate, uh, athletic, joyful, low stress, you know, whatever adaptable, whatever adjectives you want to describe yourself as better, all those things you can work towards without dieting or weight loss. It is, you know, bettering yourself is not dependent on shrinking yourself. That's a major misnomer. Will sometimes weight loss happen in the course of pursuing those other things? Yes, maybe. But you have to be okay with understanding better doesn't mean thinner. You're not giving up on yourself. Honestly, I think you're prioritizing your needs and your desires over this cultural thin ideal. And when you centralize on focus and focus your energies on you and the things that are within your control, um, it's the opposite of giving up. I think you're actually pursuing yourself and the best version of yourself even more. So hopefully that helps. Number two, is it possible to lower my cholesterol without losing weight? Yes. Yes, it is. First, there's a couple things you need to know. Dietary cholesterol has almost nothing to do with serum cholesterol. That has long since been uh, kind of debunked. Uh, the cholesterol you take in in your diet, you know, eating eggs or red meat or whatever, has very, very, very little to do with your serum cholesterol. Secondly, genetics play a huge part in cholesterol production in your liver and cholesterol metabolism. So some people are going to have high cholesterol and they will need drugs to manage their cholesterol, period. It is not a personal failure if you need to go on cholesterol lowering medications to reduce your risk of other events. But if you want to try to manage your cholesterol or um, minimize the amount of pharmacologic help that you may need, here are some things you can do. Movement affects cholesterol a lot, even low intensity movement, short amounts of movement. It doesn't have to be a massive like fitness routine. It just means avoid set complete sedentariness. Stop smoking. There's a billion reasons to stop smoking. This is on the list of billion and one reasons why smoking is bad for your health. Uh, increasing soluble fiber in your diet. So beans, avocado, broccoli, flax seeds, sweet potatoes, apples, oatmeal, stuff like that. That helps to a degree. Um, limiting alcohol intake or abstaining from alcohol completely. That affects your cholesterol uh, metabolism and production. And also processed carbohydrates, um, can increase your cholesterol. It's through a triglyceride mechanism because essentially cholesterol is a carrying case for triglyceride and fats. And so cholesterol is built by the body in order to move triglycerides around, which is just extra energy. Long story short, you can try to do some of these things. And if your cholesterol is only slightly out of range, you may be able to manage it that way. But a lot of this is genetics and liver function and things that are outside of your control. So yes, if you want to do a few things, I wouldn't go crazy. If your doctor says you need cholesterol medicine, you probably do. And I would stick to that. Okay. Number three. Oh, this is a good one. This is about me. What inspires you to be a doctor after you got a engineering degree? Okay, and you may not know this. I have it, my bachelor's degree from Vanderbilt is actually a biomedical engineering degree. Well, here's an easy answer to your question. I've always wanted to be a doctor. Always. I don't ever remember a time in my life not wanting to be a doctor, even when I was, you know, four years old. Uh, so the engineering degree was a deliberate means to an ends. I knew I wanted to go to medical school and become a physician. I knew also that it's really competitive to get into medical school. And if I didn't get into medical school immediately after college, I wanted to have a 
marketable background where I could get a job and enter the workforce. And engineering seemed like a good thing. Plus I liked it. I like math. I like science. I was pretty good at it. So uh, I never planned on being an engineer. I have never worked as an engineer. And I, at this point, probably won't. Um, So there you go. Number four, what was your wake up call or aha moment when you realized diet culture is toxic and there was another way to approach this? Well, this is a long story. Um, You can hear more of the story if you go back to, oh shoot, one of the first two or three episodes of this podcast. I kind of tell my personal story. But for me, it was a moment and then a learning process. Essentially, I was raised in diet culture. I practiced medicine in diet culture because that is the standard way of thinking, the standard way of being taught when you are in the health professions. It is just normative for all of us. So I didn't even consider it diet culture because I didn't know there was such a thing, right? Now, what happened was I was diagnosed with cancer uh, almost five years ago now. And in my recovery from cancer, I was in the pursuit of the quote, perfect diet, because I was sure that there was a perfect diet. It had eluded me to this point and I was going to find it. Well, come to find out, very long story short, there's not a perfect diet. And now I know how ridiculous that pursuit is. And that is a lifelong pursuit for many of us that never comes to anything. I went back, got a master's degree in nutrition in the process of all of this studying and realized how diet culture influenced that education was and all the registered dietitians that were coming out of that program. And I, I started learning. I just started simply with books, with journal articles, listening to podcasts, um, you know, watching meetings or anything I could to get my hands on. Um, And I'm continuing to learn. There is more and more emerging scientific information. There's more people writing. There's more people speaking about this stuff, which I'm very enthusiastic about and happy that we will make the changes that we collectively want to see. So I would say my cancer diagnosis was the turning point because had I not ever had cancer, I think I would have never thought twice about spending the rest of my life looking for the perfect diet. All right, number five, this is a simple one. Do you have a favorite food? I really don't, but I can tell you that I prefer savory and salty stuff over sweet. I don't have a major sweet tooth. Um, But if I had to name a couple of like my top foods, I love crab, like crab legs. I love crab, Um, fresh pasta and anything that is cheese or made with cheese or has cheese in it or cheese on it. I'm like a cheese aholic. I truly have never, ever, ever tasted a single kind of cheese that I did not like. Uh, even the stinky ones that nobody else likes. I like those too. What I do hate, I will tell you what I hate. I cannot stand eggs and I cannot stand mayonnaise. Um, and those two things together is like my worst nightmare. I don't like, I just can't even... I can't even. So there you go. All right, number six, how to renounce uh, the thin ideal or how to grieve your smaller body. Okay, so this last week's podcast, um, episode 55, interestingly, I talked about this. You might have submitted this question before I even published that episode, but that podcast, I go through Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's five grief stages and really show you how letting go of this future uh, dream thin version of yourself that you have in your head is you have to go through a truly a grief process. Um, but, you know, the, here's the deal. Smaller is easier in our society, full stop. And your programmed belief system that you have been conditioned to hold is that smaller is advantageous and it is better. And frankly, in a lot of ways, it we treat it that way. 
But body diversity is an actual thing. You don't get to pick your weight and work towards it and just get what you want. Not any more than you can pick the color of your hair or your height or, you know, what your voice sounds like or anything like that. It's it's really almost completely out of our control. There are only a few things that are personally controlled. A lot of it is, um, you know, early environmental influences and prenatal influences and genetics and, and epigenetics and all this sort of stuff. Um, what you need to know is that health and health promotion can happen at any size. That's what health at every size means. But it's okay to validate your feeling and grieve that you're not in control of your size. All this time that you thought you were, you actually weren't. And you have to grieve the fact that that fantasy version of yourself that you were going to be if you just worked hard enough may not happen. Now, it may happen. I'm not saying you won't get smaller ever, but what I'm saying is it's not in your control. So you have to learn how to live with those two things together and don't let that grief process stop you from honoring and respecting your body that you have now. So I would, whoever submitted this question, I would recommend going back to episode 55 and listening that all the way through so you can hear that. But it's real. It really is hard to let go of that when we have held that belief system and that thin ideal for so long. Okay, number seven, how do I find the right mindset to deal with a diagnosis of prediabetes and make healthful changes for myself without falling back into diet mentality? Okay, I, I feel this because I do know that people want to improve their health. And we have this health and weight thing, you know, linked so tightly that we believe weight loss is the answer. But if we really want to improve health, we need to talk about health. So this is where the idea of adding things comes in instead of limiting or restricting things. Add movement, add water, add sleep, add vegetables, add fiber, add social activities, whatever, okay? Um, stop restricting and dieting and this black and white, really boxed in thinking about um, white knuckling and micromanaging your physiology, it always ends in mental anguish and binging and restricting cycles, weight cycling, you know, and undoubtedly, I am sure, I'm sure your doctor that told you you have prediabetes told you to lose weight, quote, lose weight. But we know that deliberate weight loss efforts fail almost all of the time and not only just fail in terms of weight loss, they actually result in higher weight, disordered eating, mental health, you know, uh, problems and all kinds of other issues. So, you know, it's not, that's not the answer. So diverting your energy to things that are actionable because at the end of the day weight is a noun it's not a verb you don't do it so let's do the things that are doable and start adding stuff and as you add 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 things that feel good that are serving your health that are you know getting you towards your goals the restriction piece just sort of falls off and it and you don't have to stop restricting deliberately in your mind you don't have to intellectually be thinking to thought block those thoughts all the time because the other um things that you're doing to add stuff in kind of takes up that space okay let's see number eight i'm pretty sure you are a nutritionist and not a dietitian what is the difference anyway and is there a reason you didn't become a dietitian Okay, yes, there is a big difference. Um, in the U.S., and and that's where I can speak from, but I think this is pretty true in, in most other developed countries. A dietitian is a board-certified nutrition expert. 
There are governing bodies. There are universal standards and benchmarks and exams. Uh, registered dietitians are licensed health professionals. Uh, most places, nutritionists are not. Uh, there is very little to no regulation of who can call themselves a nutritionist. Um, specifically in Texas, where I am, there is essentially no rules. Uh, but there is not the level of, uh, what's the word, sort of accountability and consistency in training and, you know, checking in professional nutritionists. Uh, dietitians are required to have a bachelor's degree and starting in just a couple of years from now, actually the profession wide is going to master's degree required to sit for their boards. Dietitians have to do a very extensive internship, usually a thousand hours prior to taking their boards. And dietitians are able to provide individualized medical nutrition therapy. So their level of clinical knowledge is more extensive than nutritionists and understanding medical diagnoses is more thorough and standardized. It, you know, the lay description in my mind is that dietitians see patients, nutritionists are seeing clients. And that is more of an advisory business model. It's not a clinical interaction. So what about me? Well, I have a master's degree in nutrition and there are people in my program who subsequently applied for their RD internship to uh, go down that pathway to prep for board exam and do their internship and become dietitians. In my case, I didn't see a lot of added value in doing that because I'm already a licensed health professional. I have a medical degree and my medical training, my practice, my residency, I have the extensive clinical training, um, the diagnostic and treatment planning sort of pedigree to deal with people as patients. I was never planning to take on a career as a registered dietitian. Um, and my coaching business is purely a consultative thing. I am not establishing a doctor patient relationship with my coaching clients. Um, so I just didn't see the point in doing the internship and all the extra work and maintaining a, another degree, uh, another, you know, sort of registered, uh, health professional license. There you go. Number nine, how do you handle family members understanding your new mindset when you stop dieting? Well, you know, this is tough because especially if the diet body talk was something that connected you in the past, that is like going to seem like it came out of left field to the other people. And if these are truly your family members and your good friends, they care about you and they want what is the best. The problem is they are wrapped up in the cultural belief system that thin is best. So that's where they are misinformed. Here's how I teach people to approach this. In my opinion, you have three choices when the diet talk comes up. One, escape. Straight up, get out of the conversation. If this means getting up physically from the table and walking away, going to the other room, whatever, you may have to do that if you have already established boundaries with these people and they continue to cross them. You really need to hold them accountable for respecting you. You know, but assuming that it's not quite at that level, um, you can end the conversation and things that you might want to say would be something like this. I hear your concern, but your comments are not helping support the work that I'm doing on my body image or the things I'm choosing to eat are really not up for conversation with other people. Or I've found dieting is been very harmful to me over time and I'm no longer going to choose to diet. I prefer if we could have a different conversation or I'm not comfortable talking about these issues anymore. And perhaps um, you never know when you're going to be the one that introduces the idea. So the third choice to me is engage with them in a conversation. And that's, it's not your responsibility to teach other people, but it is your opportunity to plant the seed. If it is somebody that you have 
a trusted relationship with. So something might sound like this. You know, I've been learning, reading books, listening to podcasts, whatever you want to say about health at every size. I'm finding that I feel much more comfortable around food than I had been before. Have you ever heard of health at every size? Or I'm learning from some professionals that are teaching intuitive eating. It seems like it's working out a lot better than dieting. I have some book recommendations. Would you be interested in any of them? You know, it's just up to you how far you want to take it, but you don't have to participate in any conversation that makes you uncomfortable. And as you get out of diet culture, you're going to find more and more and more of the conversations about body and food choices and this and that, that used to just be innocuous, normal little daily conversations. Uh, they feel really poisonous to you now. Okay. Number 10. Do you really let your kids eat intuitively? Do they eat anything they want? And how do you manage that? Well, basically, more or less, yes. And now I have to say, this is kind of new to me. My kids are now almost 11 and almost 14. Um, and I have only been doing this intuitive eating way of eating for probably like two to three years. So prior to that, I was all up in diet culture. But... Now, essentially, yes, they eat intuitively, um, or I'm trying to honor their intuitive choices. Let's just say that. I still do the grocery shopping for my family. I do most of the cooking, basically all of the cooking. So I do still have control over what is in the house and what is presented at meals. But what I've learned over time is if we, as the parents don't make such a big flashy deal out of foods and don't label this good food, bad food, treat food, junk food, health food, clean food, whole food, blah, 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 blah. Um, they don't make a big deal out of that. They're learning that from us. So I will tell you in my house, we have ice cream in our freezer. Sometimes after dinner, the kids will go get some and sometimes they won't. Uh, you would think that they'd be in there every two hours till the bucket was gone, but they actually self-regulate without a bunch of really strict rules. I also try to get them in the kitchen as much as I can. You know, my kids, like I said, are, are preteen teenagers, and so they can help in the kitchen and try new things and learn some food handling and some cooking and experience food in a, a lot of different ways, which makes them just more comfortable and less stressed around it. We got bigger things to stress out about than micromanaging what they're eating. And I mean, every year I go, like we have this sort of bucket that has candy in it in our pantry. And I just went and put some Halloween candy in there and had to throw out stuff from Easter. So what was that six months ago? Yeah. So it's, it's, it's just kind of interesting how it works that when nothing is jailed and off limits, it doesn't have this magnetic allure where you constantly are going after it anyway. Okay. Number 11, we're getting there. Y'all still with me? Number 11, have you had challenges staying true to your beliefs and what threatens to derail you personally to you know, go back to dieting. Yes, of course. I'm a human. I'm a human like you are. And, uh, I live in this same very diet culture influenced society. I still see the same ads, shop at the same stores, look at the same social media. I am in it with you. The two things that I personally find the most challenging is the clothes. I will say it's frustrating to see something on a hanger that you want to wear and it doesn't fit. Now in the dieting days of past, I would have, you know, shrunk my body or attempted to shrink my body to fit into the clothes that I wanted. But that is a miserable experience. So I try um, to prevent like, having to confront my clothes all the time. I've cleaned out my closet. 
so that things in my closet right now fit me right now. I don't have to be confronted every day, every morning when I get dressed with small clothes because I've, you know, curated my closet. Um, I will go to a store and try something on and I will buy a bigger size and I'll buy even the bigger size than that. And I actually have been able to do that without getting set back because when it's comfortable and it's on my body, it doesn't matter what the tag says. So I've really had to get over that. But the second thing that is a challenge for me is I'm in menopause already um, because of going through chemo, I actually was put into like a chemical menopause at the age of 40. And so that was really abrupt and probably at least 10 or more years earlier than it would have been otherwise for me. And I'm learning a lot about menopause. Bodies change. They change in functionality. They change in appearance. Um, and it's a little that part is challenging for me because my friends who are my age, most of them are not in menopause yet. Um, but you know what? It, I'm just me and it is what it is. And, and the more time I spend perseverating on what my friends are doing or what my friends are able to look like or what they, you know, do with their bodies is self-defeating. So, you know, I will tell you, the more work you do to liberate your body image and do this anti-diet work, it comes easier and easier over time. And over time with practice, there's less and less of those diet thoughts and they're easier to get rid of. So keep up the good work. I am in it with you. Okay. All right. 12. Is it possible to ever let go of all the food rules? Yes. Yes, it is. And I will tell you what, that finding a neutral belief system about food and neutral language around food and letting go of all these food rules actually, in my opinion, is easier than dealing with the body image issues. So the way you go about doing this is allow yourself to start eating again and just start small. If challenging yourself by eating one thing that was previously, you know, off limits or on your bad list, um, you can do it that way and do it, sort of reintroduce food incrementally. Uh, I honestly kind of try to go cold turkey and just straight up stop making decision based on dieting rules. And there's not one right way to do this, but what you need to be thinking is when you have this idea of why you're choosing a food. Why do I believe this? Why do I believe this is what I want to pick? Where did that thought come from? And really make sure that it's your thinking. That's the, that's the key. Okay. 13. I have a few friends that have had gastric bypass Um, several different procedures they list here. They post pictures all the time of their weight loss before and after pictures and talk about how quote healthy they are. Now, every time I see that I get so depressed and feel bad about myself. How do I stop thinking like this? How do I stop thinking that thinner is better? Um, oh, it says, how do I stop thinking that thinner is better or easier? Well, here, here's the first problem is you're going to, your last question is the first one to answer better and easier are two separate things. Okay. In our society, thin is easier, but that doesn't mean it's better. That doesn't mean it's right. That doesn't mean you can control it. There's a lot of things that are easier. It's also easier to be white. It's also easier to be a male. It's also easier to, uh, live in a higher income, you know, neighborhood. Like there's a lot of things But we don't obsess over that because we presume we can't change those things. But for some reason, our culture has this belief that your size, you can change. So it is normal. It's normal, normal, normal to see your friends flaunting their thinner post-surgical bodies and to feel angry, triggered, envious, annoyed, whatever it is when they're getting all that attention and praise. But... 
there's two things you can do. Number one is learn the science about dieting and weight regulation, learn about health at every size, and you will come to believe with objective evidence that weight is not changeable in the way you have been uh, taught to believe. Secondly, if you don't want to look at the scientific evidence, you can just use your anecdotal experience and look back over time and see what your own weight loss pursuits have done. What has happened to your social, physical, mental, emotional health after years and decades of dieting? Okay, this is where unwinding some of this with the assistance of a supportive community, a coach, a professional may help you do this. Because I will tell you what, even bariatric surgery for many people ends up being this, uh, you know, loss. They don't change anything in their head. They're very likely to gain the weight back. And then they have to deal with being back in the original body or the nearly original body and the emotional fallout of they've, quote, failed their last chance option. Um, also there's, you know, the propensity to have medical complications and stuff. So don't be deluded to think that bariatric surgery is a perfect answer across the board either. I wouldn't look at your friends that had bariatric surgery and their before and after pictures any differently than anybody else who is putting up their before and after pictures and telling you how wonderful their life is because either one of two things is going on. Number one, their life may very well be better, but I would attribute that largely to things outside of their size. Or number two, their life is not actually that much better, but that's what they're supposed to say when they've spent so much time, effort, and money to achieve the cultural ideal of perfection. So it's not, you know, the grass is not always greener, as they say. But that's a good question because that comes up for a lot of people. All right, number 14. This is short. Is this your full-time job or do you still work as a doctor? Uh, basically, yes, this is my full-time job for the moment. I do a little bit of telemedicine uh, consults uh, as a contract physician as needed when I want. But this anti-diet work, my podcast, my coaching business, my speaking platform is what I do full-time now. 15. What are some simple ways I can tell my doctor I don't want to be weighed at my visit? I'm still super anxious about this and I don't want to seem like a confrontational patient. Okay, good question. And this is a big one for a lot of people. You have to understand, I know there's this power differential in the doctor's office and it's easy to feel intimidated or sort of, um, I don't know what the word is like on the short end of the stick, but the medical profession operates on informed consent. And that includes the scale patients hardly ever hesitate to decline other stuff that they don't want. You know, if you don't want to have surgery, you don't want to have a blood test done. You don't want to have a your membrane stripped, you don't want an x-ray, you don't want to try a new medication, you don't want a blood draw, you don't want a blood transfusion. Like people say no to that all the time. But the belief is that the scale is compulsory and it's actually not. There's only a few diagnoses, a few clinical indications where they need your correct, accurate two-day weight. And I've talked about this before, but those are the exceptions and not the rule. So the first thing I would say is you may find that declining the scale is ends up not being as big of a deal as you're making it out to be in your head. Because a lot of my community members and my clients have done this for the first time and they were super kind of anxious and all in their head about saying no to the scale. And when they said, no, thank you, the person who was asking them to be weighed just sort of said, okay, and moved on. So it may not be as big of an obstacle as you think. But if you need to know how to script this. I have a whole workshop on that, but, uh, things like I'm going to decline my weight today because I don't think it's relevant to the reason I'm here today. Or 
I'm working on recovering from dieting and disordered body image issues. I would like to opt out unless it's absolutely medically necessary. Or uh, here's a good one to sort of kick the can down the road. I'd like to talk to my doctor first before my visit issue today before stepping on the scale. And you know what will happen is once you get in the room and the doctor talks to you, nobody will ever drag you back out in the hallway to get weighed. So there's a lot of scripting. There's a lot. It's, you know, there's more nuance than this. But essentially you have authority and autonomy to say no to the scale and to do it in a respectful way and still have your needs met for the visit. And uh, let me know if I can help you do that. And here we are. 16. See, I told you it wasn't even going to be close to a minute per. Number 16. Now that I've started to try intuitive eating, I've gained some weight. I don't weigh myself, but it's obvious that my old clothes don't fit the same. See, it's the clothes. It's always the clothes. How do I trust that this is going to work and I'm not going to just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger? Okay, here's the deal. If you are really, really, really intuitively eating and following your body's lead, you will eventually stabilize your weight in your set point range. The body does not like chaos. It likes steady state. Um, And if you have gained some weight in the process of learning intuitive eating, it probably is an indication that your previous diet culture weight was below your natural set point weight. If you were having to expend lots and lots of effort and lots and lots of energy to weight suppress yourself, when you stop doing that, you may, quote, rebound some of that weight, but that is weight that's supposed to be on your body. Your body wants to work. The nerdy homeostasis word that I've talked about in the past, the body wants to get to its maximum sort of optimization range be at its peak functionality and stay there. That's homeostasis. Getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger would not be a steady state. So the body doesn't really want to do that. But the fact that you're fearing weight gain or weight and the fact that you are concerned your body's going to do that does give me like a little bit of insight that um, you still have some of that built-in anti-fat bias making you think that weight is bad, weight gain is bad. Even if your health is improving right before your eyes, if weight gain accompanies that, then the whole thing is bad. And it's okay. It's okay. I'm not shaming you, whoever asked this question, but this is how deeply embedded our thoughts are. We almost cannot be objective about this because we are so conditioned. But this is where you have to trust. You have to trust your body and that your body has the ability to take care of itself, that you have the ability to make decisions about food and eating and establishing or reestablishing that trust is the work of intuitive eating. Intuitive eating is not a diet. It's not memorizing a bunch of rules and memorizing meal plans and all the stuff that we've been used to doing. It is a process of reestablishing trust with yourself in regard to food and nutrition. And that summarizes the whole experience. It is hard work. It is hard. It is hard to learn that trust while you are completely immersed in a fat phobic, weight centered, thin ideal diet culture existence. That is why you need a community. That is why you need to be in my Facebook group, to be talking to your friends about this, to join other networks of people who are doing this hard work so that they can support you and you can support them. Um, It's really different than dieting. Dieting thrives on isolation. You take your meal plan and your tracker and you just do the work and mind your own business, but that doesn't, That's not how life is. This um, coming out of that and re-entering a space of respect and trust for yourself is a lot of work. And I'm here to help you. There's many, many other 
uh, professionals that are out there doing this work with all sorts of different backgrounds, whether you need more of the body image help, whether you need to work with somebody who's got more experience with exercise and fitness, whether you want to work with somebody more clinically um, inclined from the mental health standpoint, there's just a lot of people that want to help you. All right, we made it. Happy birthday. It's like 16 questions uh, in 45 minutes. So not at all what I bargained for. But if you're still here at the end, I appreciate you being my listener and being in my community. If you have feedback about the podcast, leaving a rating or review will take you a hot second on your uh, iTunes player or wherever you listen to your podcasts. If you have extra bandwidth to give me additional feedback, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, either message me on social media or email me hello at maggielandismd.com. I want to know what content you want for this upcoming year. I'm sort of uh, strategizing the next year of the Eat Fluencer podcast and would love your input. So I look forward to continuing this conversation with you. Happy birthday to the Eat Fluencer podcast, and we'll see you next Wednesday. Thank you so much for being here today. If you love what you've learned, follow me on social media at Maggie Landis MD and you'll never miss a thing. You can also check out my website at MaggieLandisMD.com and sign up to be part of our community of eaters. Thanks again for stopping by. We'll talk again soon.